Podcasts Radio Network proudly presents The Broadcasters Podcast, where we dive deep into the media industry headlines and dissect the digital disruption that diverges the masses into the new media counterculture and away from the media establishment. Here is the king of podcasts. This is the Broadcasters Podcast, episode number 231. I'm king of podcasts, giving you a proper introduction to this program tonight. Because I might have a few people listening in, perhaps because of the folks at Jacobs Media, because they put out a blog post, that's going to be part of the focus of what I'm going to be talking about today on the program. The major focus is Kate Bush. I can't help myself. We got to keep talking about the major contribution. And is listen, it's because of Stranger Things on Netflix. The fourth season, starting with the first episode and continuing on throughout as an arc going along with a storyline that is embedded into the series. Not just that song. You also have musical use past the judgy also reaching the charts again. It's the effect that you have with movies, sometimes with television, and it shows you the difference. I mean, for TV, it, it definitely helps a lot. When you see Euphoria, that series consistently always has some new songs that get brought to the forefront, and you hear about it, and you're like, wow, what an amazing thing to see. And then you also get the same thing going with, I mean, you look at, if it's events like, say, on Fortnite, or if, uh, if it's on Roblox, or if it's on Twitch, or whatever it might be, social media, and everything that's around there, there's so many promotional tools. And so, you know, just those kind of things that happen that it accidentally just creates opportunities for something to go viral. If it's not a clip, if it's not a meme, it's sometimes it's music, sometimes it's a song, sometimes it's a challenge. TikTok does it a lot. It's not even a TikTok challenge that made this song get back up to the top of the charts. So unlike last year when Dreams by Fleetwood Mac made it back up to the top, back into the top 40. First time since 1976. And then this song in 1985, I forget how far up the chart this song actually went. I don't know if I got to see where it was. But if you're watching MTV, you probably would have seen the video, for all we know. I don't remember it for sure myself, but I never really looked to see where Kate Bush was in terms of how far up the Billboard charts she actually ever, ever went in her history. So to go back and look, I can't tell when was the last time it happened as well, but we have to go into the story itself. Now, Fred Jacobs wrote a great blog post about it, but there are a number of other places I also want to go that have to talk about what's going on because Kate Bush is the talk of music right now. Who would have thought this would happen again? And it's great. 61-year-old Kate Bush, her her career is brought back up again. It's just like a couple of years ago, but you know, over a decade ago, the Rick rolling thing and Rick Astley gets a new lease on life with his music from the late 90s, the late eighties, excuse me. It's things like that that continue to keep happening. The reason why, for whatever reason, some people want to keep having the killers, Mr. Brightside in the top 200 of the official charts or no, the top 100 on the official charts in the UK regularly. If they can, it's all of this. But I'm going to take a couple of stories real quick that have come out because everybody keeps talking about her. And I can't help myself. It's, it's such, it's such a fascinating story. It's an a, attribution to the digital disruption and how irrelevant radio and music. Listen, Kate Bush, we we're going to learn in this show how she's one of the biggest indie artists the record labels are not even benefiting off of this the radio is not benefiting from it it's social media and it's netflix and kate bush herself is benefiting greatly from the royalties now of the streaming for this song of which is one of my playlists as well she almost got the number one song in the united kingdom in her home country Almost did. Harry Styles holds on for a 10th week, but she was almost there. Incredible. So there's all this we got to talk about. And also the thought that it even brought up here about how a song can be new again and how a new audience can discover it. Because we've talked extensively about new music discovery on this program the last several weeks. 
But it's not to say that new music can't be discovered that we haven't heard in a while. That happens all the time, too. And sometimes it happens because we'll hear it in a commercial or in a movie, something like that. Imagine now next week when the Elvis movie comes out and Austin Butler and Tom Hanks, that feature film comes out the theaters widescreen release next week. Imagine how many Elvis Presley songs might chart. Now, we already know that Vegas by Doja Cat has already charted right now. That's part of the Elvis soundtrack. But what other songs will make their way up? Will there be enough people? Will there be enough buzz? Because the opportunity apprises itself. It, it presents itself. That's the word I'm looking for. Imagine if the Elvis movie does so well and we start seeing Elvis Presley records. And which ones do we hear that make their way up? Do we hear the early songs from 56? Do we hear the stuff from 68? The, the return of Elvis, which, I mean, there's only so much I remember of it, but there's so many songs that I listen to Elvis that I like a lot. I mean, him, like the Beatles, like the Rolling Stones, pick it. Like Phil Collins, okay? Really, lots and lots and lots. And like Elton John, there's lots of songs to enjoy. A full library fills up a couple albums. And that's the potential here. And so if you are resurrecting new music remember that the older artists we already know now that they're absolutely happy with interpolation they don't mind if other artists will use their music to rehash recreate music that is new again if you listen to the dance music that's out there, the euro dance there's lots of songs being interpolated by the way last year running up that hill was interpolated by meg myers and anima uh, anima excuse me that's the one then already right now Okay, there's LaRue in it for the kill. That's being now put into a mix right now by Tion Wayne, the British rapper. You have Oliver Heldens, who's a DJ, working with now Rogers, but getting him back in front of a bass guitar to do Kiss. And I was made for loving you, the disco song from Kiss from 1978, I think it was. Having that song made into a dance record for today. And there's many examples to go along after that. Oh, uh, Tom Santa, the song called Rainfall. They're interpolating the Winans and Praise You. Oh, no, not uh, Shackles and Mary Mary. That's who it was. Sorry, that's what it was. Shackles and Mary Mary. And so you have all these songs that would be brought back up, and people would just go ahead and find something old that's new again. Kate Bush is the central example right now. And this is what's important. Because when something like this happens, it shouldn't be a fluke. It should be something that happens a lot. And radio and music need to get their act together because they're completely lost. They want to monetize, but they don't know how, and they're missing the boat. Fred Jacobs does a pretty good job of explaining that. I really appreciate him taking my request to talk about this story because I brought it up to him. He actually cites me in the article. Thank you, Fred Jacobs. I really appreciate it. If you brought me a couple of new listeners, I appreciate it, and thank you for listening. I appreciate that. So he talks about why is Kate Bush running up the charts. And so he says, I sent him a story. It was from USC Today with a long but fascinating title. Once upon a time, musicians hated making videos for MTV. Now artists ire are aimed at TikTok. And we've talked a couple weeks ago about the likes of Halsey, FKA Twigs, Ed Sheeran, Florence Welsh, pushing back against their record labels that a TikTok video is insisted as prerequisite to release their next single. Meanwhile, they don't have the kind of thing where like a Drake is about to go ahead and come out with a new album. I don't know if you know about that, but yeah, just a surprise. Drake is putting out his new album, Honestly, Never Mind, as I record tonight. So Friday morning at midnight releases the album. In the UK, the song might actually chart sometime in their midweek chart. Billboard, it takes a week. But imagine what happens when we get to that. And you start seeing some of the albums that are coming out this summer. We had Kendrick Lamar. We had Post Malone, Jack Harlow, you know, and did they make much of a dent? Harry Styles did make a very big dent. Bad Bunny made a huge dent. But is radio and music, I mean, because the music labels with their legacy artists, yeah, they're going to do just fine. But where's radio in it? Radio completely misses us. What a... Uh, this uh, real, radio in real time should be able to be the easiest producers of new content and getting content to the forefront when it's happening right here and now. It's their fault they don't have the 
the wherewithal. They don't have the resources because they took them away. Hell, iHeartRadio this week is now laying off more people. You're taking away the resources that could be doing it. Now, maybe they might have the morale of like nothing and they might not even care about doing that, right? So he gives the radio industry a chance to pick up and, you know, get up to speed on the issue of TikTok, you know, taking over the job of radio as new music discovery. All right. They are the Magellans of of music discovery right now. You guys, radio has lost it. And it's not like the, it's not like the employees there. It's not like the good people fighting the good fight, trying to put out good radio are not given the chance. They're not trying. If given the chance, I'm sure they would do right. But radio itself, the corporate, your bureaucracy is lost. They don't care. They don't care about content. They don't care about programming. They really don't. They're not sound in this. They don't let radio people do programming. They are salespeople. They're sales and marketing people that they just think, well, this is just another platform for marketing and advertising, and we just need to put something around it. See, the priority is marketing and advertising. Whatever monetizes. The music, it doesn't monetize. It's basically 40 to 44 minutes of filling time buffer in between the commercials because the commercials matter. That's what really matters. So you'd rather concern yourself where you can actually make the music something better. You can keep people completely involved. Time spent is going to be increased. You can actually create more retaining of audience and keep them locked in because you give them something more than what Spotify and Pandora and Apple music can give you. Those guys don't have live broadcasts yet. They don't have live personalities. And you know what? Some people don't want to hear what Sirius XM has with what they're doing and how they do their thing either. They don't want to pay, what, 12, 15 bucks a monthly for it either. So the opportunity has always been here. And there's nothing wrong if you wanted to embed advertising or live reads or whatever the hell you want throughout the entire broadcast day. You should be monetizing the jocks. They should be so important that their value becomes value to your leads, to your clients, because you devalued your advertising to such a a minimal nothing because you concern yourself with advertising by revenue stream. You don't consider advertising by your assets. The assets that are your talent, the assets that are your producers, your engineers, assets, your talent should be good enough they need to be good enough that they can get an advertiser. You give them a spot to read, and it's not recorded. You give it to them live. Come on, these people can do live reads. Make them do it live. And give a lot of reads. And you do it throughout the music. And then you also get these record labels back on board with you and have them promote your their albums or your singles or whatever. Get them so they'll start getting your audience to buy downloads again. And give them bundles and give them extra things. Send them to get merchandise. Get them to buy tickets. What is wrong with you, radio? I'm just doing this because, you know what? The summer of radio, I'm going to keep bashing away until somebody starts paying attention. And I don't mind. I have all the time in the world. And I don't care about the big of an audience that I have that might not want to listen to me on my soapbox. But I'm going to do it because that's what I want this show for. That's what I started this show in 2018 for in the first place. 220, 230 episodes ago. That was my plan. Back into this. He talks about now the early days of MTV. It was a certain same story for certain artists who looked down on rock videos. The legacy artists, Peter Gabriel, Michael Jackson, Robert Palmer, but other artists, Dylan, Tom Petty, and Bob Seger, pushed back against the trend, at least initially. And then he talks about a TikToker that mentions about how her account is loaded with video snippets of her seen and shared by thousands with or without the benefit of radio airplay. And it used to be the time where music would become popular here and then it would just spread around the, the, rest of, the rest of the world. That doesn't happen as much. Lauren Spencer Smith? Well, that song didn't get over... Any of her songs? Uh, fingers crossed or... 
Flowers. Those songs didn't make it over here yet. And she was an American Idol artist. Those songs made it in the UK and charted. And then they started playing over here. Radio misses the boat. Gale, ABCDFU. That song didn't make it for weeks in that 9 to 12 week cycle, as we always talk about. It might stream well, but then who comes late to the game? Radio. And why? There's not even a reason for it. What is media base holding people over for? I mean, it's such an antiquated, such an irrelevant piece of tracing that's all together. Go back to Billboard. Let them use what they use to determine what you're doing. Like, why are you spending, why is iHeartRadio, uh, why is iHeartRadio and other Contemporary hit radio stations, why are they not programming as top 40, number one? Number two, why are they using media base as a source? Why does it matter? It's just extra equipment. It's just extra facts and figures from something that's being made up. It's it's a made-up list, to me anyway. It has no rhyme and reason. There's no, I mean, is there's nothing organic about it that gives me like there's an algorithm and it, it calculates. They just fiddle with the numbers and they just generate what they want it to be. And that's how they want it to be. It doesn't matter to them. Certain legacy artists, when they chart, they got Billboard in their back pocket because they, because Billboard had to change their algorithm to include radio plays, radio spins much more prominently. That's why the top 10 on Billboard is usually loaded with radio songs, which of which those songs are constantly getting 40 to what, 60 million spins in any given station. So for instance, there's the new, uh, there is one place where they have the Billboard Hot 100 chart predictions. And that's coming up for the week ending June 17th. Well, I mean, well it was for Ju- week ending June 17th. This is the current list. So somebody put this up there, and I can look at streaming and airplay. You look at Harry Styles and Jack Harlow, one and two, this past week. And they're getting 74 and 78 million spins of airplay across radio stations. And then you look at Lizzo, she's now around 50 million, 45 million for Glass Animals, 55 million for Lotto and Big Energy. And then you get lucky if a couple of their songs make their way up just on streaming. And yeah, some songs are streaming, so it lines up. So your top five Puerto Morris, Morris, Morris lines up. But here's you go. Kate Bush running up that hill, 22,000 in sales. That's more than anybody else on the chart. 29 million in streaming, which would put her third. No, that would put her number. She would be second among all uh, songs in streaming right now. Because she's just behind Future and Drake attempts with Wait For You, which is number three on the Billboard chart this past week. But Airplay, 1%. 1.7 million spins. One of the most popular songs. Hey, you're telling me you don't have a young audience that's not without watching young Stranger Things and then the other audience of Gen Xers like myself that are all in the 80s pop culture and we're watching this show. It's got a wide audience. Why are you not paying attention to this? They don't. When it comes to the Stranger Things cast, have we heard them anywhere on any U.S. radio stations? No, I don't think so. I haven't seen the clips, though. BBC Radio did. Why do they always get that right and the U.S. gets it wrong? This is this corporate bureaucracy that just controls and suffocates any creativity, any programming lightness that could be good for, for the good of things. Why are they trying to avoid? I really feel like, is this like a conspiracy? Are we just trying to sabotage radio? Are the private equity firms that hold these radio stations hostage? Are they just trying to sabotage them so they could continue to go ahead and pick them apart like vultures? I believe that's what it is. Now, he talked about the influencing music tastes of TikTok before, sometimes in odd ways. The the dude in the skate, skateboard drinking ocean spray, cranberry juice, rocking the Fleetwood Max dreams. And it's the idea is to meet the audience where they are. You might have artists that may not share musical sensibilities, but their fans, respectively, hang out in the same vicinity. Lori Lewis, who's another... Uh, prominent radio journalist she brought up tiktok reels and similar outlets saying quote focus more on the art of creating short form video that's entertaining inspiring or helping us discover something new 
So, as we know, the effect of Stranger Things and how things happen where there was an uh, article in The Ringer that Fred Jacobs cites about how music charts are just being warped by digital media platforms and that how that song, intricate into the plot of the show, has soared to the top of the daily streaming rankers in the U.S. and the U.K. For the first time ever, Kate Bush, Kate Bush finds her song on the top 10 of the Billboard Hot 100, which I don't think ever happened before. And we'll talk about that because let me just switch over to another story from Billboard that talks about this specifically. Because Billboard put a featured article on this, and she's already breaking records for 22, 2022 sales and streaming smashes, right? And it could go to radio, too. But we're waiting to go to radio now. Stranger Things has already been out over a month. The song's already been charting for weeks. It's not that hard. You have this song. It's not like you, this is like, oh, this is, who is this artist? What's this song? If you people on radio don't know who Kate Bush is, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, granted, I didn't know necessarily even growing up about Kate Bush because I wasn't necessarily, the, the music that she made didn't really resonate for me at my age. But it wasn't like I said until last week I'll talk about that I was watching the 1979 Top of the Pops story of on BBC. And they mentioned her being a new artist with a song that taught, reached the top of the charts with Wuthering Heights. It was 1978 song was in 79 if i'm correct but people can correct me if i'm wrong but yeah radio programs are starting to add kate bush and running up that hill into the playlists and you know what when i listen to it it does hold up it really does but now if people are listening to running up that hill let me put it to you like this i appreciate the word that billboard is saying about this but do you know how much of a difference there is right now sure there's a 520 percent increase of airplay for kate bush is running up that hill but where's the song listed it was at 75 last week now it's number 45 and this is for the new chart ending june 20th for the week of june 20th the media based building chart that's her top 40 chart and there you go that song makes it there. Alternative, are they even caring about it? Uh, doesn't look like... Oh, no, she's at number 49. No, she's at 23 now. So now radio wants to get in. A little too late. By the way, Stranger Things... We're, we're wait, Now, sure, Stranger Things has another release of another second half of their season. So that song's continue to go ahead and resonate and get viral as of July 1st, and then we'll go on for probably another month. So this summer, Kate Bush can really do well on streaming, but then will any of her other songs catch fire? That's the other thing we got to worry about too, because we in America, we never really got a whole lot of exposure to Kate Bush. I know I didn't. And so that's the, one of the things that's being said. Now, Nina Braca at Billboard talks about this. So, her track, Running Up That Hill, went to number four on this week's Billboard Hot 100, 37 years after its release. The single was off of Kate Bush's 1985 classic Hounds of Love album, which previously the album peaked at number 30 on November 30, 1985. So there was no singles. As far as I know, I don't know if any singles ever reached up there at all. By the way, the song right now on Billboard is actually clean, is now claiming the number one spot on the Hot Rock and Alternative Songs chart. So that's where they are right now. The song posted 5.3 million in all format radio airplay among reporters, but that's not counting CHR, which should be the audience that definitely plays it. And hell, before this, it was somebody else who had this song that charted better. Now, here's the thing. Meg Myers did a version of Running Up That Hill in 2020, and it was an alternative number one. And that's the song I'm talking about. Became a dance hit from for Anima this year, earlier this year, and it was a great. Like I mean, I understand what what the the appeal is, and Meg Myers doing a great version in a modern way of it. But that song, listening to it now, really has kind of a timeless feel to it. There's definitely parts in the Kate Bush song that, at, towards the end of it, into the chorus, into the main part, telling off to the end of the song, it really holds up. 
it's interesting. It's just, it's a cool vibe, man. So top 40 stations now, they're trying to get it trending to break onto their adult pop songs listing on Billboard and perhaps the pop songs chart next week. With an appetite coming from TikToks, viral tweets, and various Kate Bush memes from a younger generation who were devouring the song for the first time, it's connected with a younger audience and it causes older listeners to rediscover the track. So they're talking to a couple of different radio stations about what's going on. Not only does it sonically match some of the popular music of the past few years' 80s pop revival, it's a lyrically relevant song as the themes of the track could reflect the current social climate. That the introspective lyrics could be said about viewing a situation from another perspective is something that listeners could all use a little more of right now. And that comfort music in the post-pandemic world has been a big trend where songs might sound more familiar or more popular than newer tracks. So no matter how viral or thematically resonant the song is, radio programmers could still be forgiven. No, they can't. No, they can't. You can make room for a song like that and feature it. You don't have to put it in full rotation if you don't want to. But you can at least focus on it and actually, you know what? We're cool. We understand. We're hip. We're caught up. We actually, I mean, where are the morning shows that are catching on to things like this? Are they? No, let's talk about Kim Kardashian and, you know, Pete Davidson or something like that. Let's talk about some random gossip that you have to be told to tell because there's nothing else. Or talk about pandemic or some other crap that you want to talk about. You think just something that's very watered down and cringeworthy, basically. So for the future of the song, it's being said that, you know, Kate Bush could be rediscovered. And I'm sure people are doing that right now. My curiosity is what other songs could come up that will really catch on for audiences. Because her her catalog is very wide ranging. I've never listened to a lot of her songs. I only know of a couple of them. But I'll tell you, I'm curious if more things are going to happen like this. And is this, this opportunity happens more often. I want to see that happen. I do. Now back to the Fred Jacobs article. And so he talks about the story that came from the ringer and in the story, they make mention of that for some time now, the trend has been solidifying old music is growing more valuable than new music. We know about that because we also know how much been publishing deals certain artists are getting for their records and their music and their old library being sold to publishers. We know that. Luminate Data, the old MRC data and Nielsen Music, at the start of the year, they said that music that was older from the past 18 months made up 70% of the U.S. market, up five percentage points from the pre prior. Now, part of that's going to be the pandemic because a number of artists did not put out music. And, you know, they didn't have anything to tour with. Okay. But we should not be at the point where we don't have any new music right now to be playing and why there's such a lack of new music right now. It's not hard for certain artists to go and have music being done from their home studio and not having to go to an actual studio and have to go out into the public. I mean, it's becoming more often we're starting to see people that are just able to go and record records. They don't have to be in the same studio if you got a feature. All that going on. And with even some of the music that's coming out now, it's not the best quality. You're not getting everybody in there and all these great studio musicians and all. We're not getting Muscle Shoals or the Hit Factory or something like that. We're not getting any of that right now. So everyone's cashing in on catalog music. The music, the artists, the labels, audio and video streaming platforms, social media and video games, except radio. This is where Fred Jacobs, this is where he catches my attention because this is what I want him to do. This is what I hoped he would have done when I brought the story up. Because I need somebody else who's very much more reputable that has a better rapport with radio programmers and executives than I do. Because I'm just a big loudmouth on this microphone. 
but at least he could say it with some panache, with some polish, and, you know, class. I can do that. But radio pisses me off so much because I want to be a cheerleader for radio again. It was still something I care about. I mean, I even think about today. If I had hit the lottery at any time right now, I would always want to go ahead and put money into a radio station so I could program it. I would back what everything I, I say right here on this here, I would back it up. And by the way, I got a chance to do that in 2019. Don't not forget, I did mention how I got to work on a Spanish radio station. And I got to build that up to where it was completely like disorganized and disheveled. And I came in. We got on-air personalities in there. I wasn't allowed to get them on live because they couldn't pay them, but they paid for voice tracking. And when we did that, then we got them to go ahead and put something together, and I found a good formula to get the music, get the get the art, the personalities in there, get them involved, get the programming better. It was the best I could do at the time, but I discovered and I pushed new music all the time, even though I got backlash from the sales team all the time. I don't care. I don't care. This is going to work. And you know what? We were making money. Because there wasn't much money money being made before. But once I got that station running and rocking, that station started making some money. But the kind of money they needed to make for it to turn profit wasn't going to happen. And I only got about, what? Well, first of all, the station did not run 24 hours. Well, it was weird because, well, it was an FM translator, right? And... They didn't want to program the station 24 hours when they couldn't monetize it. So when I first got in there, it was only the day parts. Sunrise and sunset, would you actually have the station broadcasting broadcasting in Spanish? And then it would go to Haitian Creole. It would simulcast one of their other stations at night. So you couldn't get to keep that audience. It wasn't until we got the owner to go ahead and change his mind and give us 24 hours. And then we got that. And then we got everything working out and we got a, I got the advertisers on. We were doing a good job with it. We needed some things to happen to get some promotion going, to get some events going on, to get some other sponsors on and could have happened within the first year, but only had about six months of real traction to make it happen. And I was still learning on the fly. Like, I knew what I knew, needed to do with the music. But when it came to being program director of this station, it was just kind of hard. But, like, I'll tell you, I would have done it for free. And I more or less did. Like, I did it as, as a where I did basically the consulting. But then I took over the program direction for nine months. Almost a, Actually, I took it for a year, pretty much. Because the last three months after, uh, towards the end, is what I did successfully. Like, I didn't get the station to where I wanted to be. If I had more time... And I would have gotten in there sooner. I could have turned that around. But instead, the owner was able to go ahead and lease that station off because it became viable to keep it a Spanish station. And then he got somebody else just to buy it. License marketing agreement. Good to go. I mean, that's what I could do for the guy. And that's what I was able to do. So I had that chance. And I'll tell you, if I get a chance again, I would absolutely want to go ahead and jump on board and run another radio station. I would totally want to do that if I had the money, if I had the wherewithal. It's something I just think about. Every other medium, Fred Jacobs, back to the article, he says is benefiting from this now long time trend where older music, let's call it classic, is truly much more mass appeal than anything released since the turn of the new millennium. And I tell you, I have three playlists on Spotify I listen to. One represents... All the music that I listened to growing up from middle school all the way to now. And I it's on Spotify called Soundtrack of South Florida. So it's everything that Miami Radio and the clubs down here in South Florida will play and all of that. And I incorporated everything into that list from around like 1987 all the way to, say, current day. <clears throat> so if there's a new song that I felt like would have fit in the current age of radio that was in the late 80s early 90s into the 2000s that song gets added to the mix i add new songs in there pretty regularly if they make the cut then i have a new music list which is basically anything from the last three of really the last one to like four months 
Like I really keep that tight and I change a lot of songs on there pretty regularly. And then I have one called Timeless Hits. And I do like enjoying that because when I get to curate my list, and I'm sure some of you out there do the same thing. If you're able to curate an old school list of music that you like and you really get to picture what you have, can you have that option of going through Spotify or Apple and just picking out the songs and curating? Like for Spotify, for me, it's just so easy to do that. I did it. And I look and I'm saying, I can make a great long play of this, which radio will never do. And I can put together such an expansive library of music. Because right now, <clears throat> I'm looking at my Timeless Hits collection. It's over 24 hours, and I believe it's like 76 hours of music. And what I have currently right now are over 1,200 songs. 1,252 to be exact. There's not a whole lot of uh, re repetition when I play that list. So I can go back in there whenever I want. When I look at my soundtrack of South Florida, that has 943 songs, and that's 61 hours. And it's still pretty good. Like, I got a good mix in there <clears throat> because it, it doesn't, not all the old music stays in there. And, like, it's just when you were talking about a good 35, almost 40 years worth of music, well, 35 years of music in there, and I could pick of the best of the best, almost a thousand songs. That's a pretty good playlist too. Like that could be a standalone station if I wanted to do that. Dance, bass, hip hop, reggae. And I'm not even counting rock, which in that time frame I could have put a rock playlist of like everything I wanted to. And maybe I will down the line, but I haven't done it because I already have too much to work off with just the three lists. But this consumes me instead of radio. You know, you know what radio could do to actually make me go back and listen to them pretty consistently and tolerate the commercials, how bad they are? First of all, they need to change the commercials. You need to get back to jingles. You need to get back to something that's starting to get traction, get people interested again. But radio doesn't want to change the commercials. I said this last week. I said it the week before. I've been saying this for week after week. And the same thing goes for the programming. If you let your honor personalities, by the way, why do they have to be so young? Why do they have to be appealing for video or whatever? Why don't you get some older, established, mature talent doing the picking of the music and let them give some expertise and show how good they can be? Why does it have to be younger for CHR? When we look at all the legendary radio stations of, of these stars that we had of, well, you know, like we could look at KHJ or we could look at WR.FM or WABC or WQAM here down here in Miami. There are a bunch of 30 and 40 year olds guys. And I don't want it to be guys. I want it to be guys and girls, but they can be older. They can be mature. They can have younger voices. They don't have to be like it, it. Let's get back to radio being radio. Let's get back to radio with the faces of radio. Let's get back to that. Let's get back to the Hawaiian shirts. Let's get back to having fun in the radio station. And the fun resonates and it actually reverberates into what's going on in the studio. And then the music and the enjoyment of the music. Let's get back to that. We can't have fun anymore. And it's been fun since deregulation. Since the dreaded Telecommunications Act of 1986, which you know I did a whole show on. Now, Kate Bush, along with the rest of us, could have never predicted their, her 80s it would be charting everywhere. The song stands out similarly but different, the way it did when the Hounds of Love album was produced and Ruth was its first song. So classic hits and classic rock still does really well. The only problem is they need to get past 250 songs in their playlist. They need to actually increase it. Some do, but really not so much. So radio's ability to make hit records is diminished, replaced by the reach, ubiquity, and buzz of new media platforms. That never had to happen, Fred. I'm sure you agree with me. And second, radio's formats that focus on exposing this great old music to new generations of fans should be knocking down the best power ratios in the business. Yeah. But we don't see that, do we? Right? What I'm saying is, Radio was the home of making hit records. There are plenty of songs that are of classic rock, that are of classic pop, that they were all discovered because somebody on a radio station played it. That's how it always works. So one random station plays it, and all of a sudden, here we go, the song gets some resonance. 
and that's how it works. We don't get that now. New media platforms. Radio could have avoided what their other corporate partners or corporate cohorts are doing right now where they're losing the streaming wars and how the music labels are losing the streaming wars as well. Radio didn't have to lose. Radio needs to learn to reorganize. They need to reformat themselves. They need to take some of the things from the previous generations, what is old is new again, rehash, recreate, go back to that. You know, a couple of good contests where you're giving away money, that doesn't hurt either. And not some text contest where you're the ninth person on a national contest. If you can do a national contest, then put more giveaways out there. And like I said, of course, radio's not going to do this live and local on every station in the country. You're not going to get that. So let's do a national format. Let's do what BBC Radio does and give away lots of free stuff. Giveaway after giveaway after giveaway, and then the commercials get better. And then the people that you have on the air, you make them better. You give them more experience, more maturity. You put them on. But we don't want to do that. It's just, it was a damn shame. I wish it wasn't that way, but they don't know any better. Now, this is fascinating. Music Business Worldwide put out about who's benefiting from this viral push right now of Kate Bush and running up that hill. Music Business Worldwide put out a great story here. Now, first of all, the song was 100% written by Kate Bush. She wrote and produced it. <laughs> and probably didn't know, anybody never thought that was the most interesting information about the track on Spotify. So the copyright and the sound recording is owned by Noble and Bright. Kate Bush owns the entire recording copyright to Running Up That Hill, as well as the Hounds of Love album and the rest of her biggest hits. Now, they, they are distributed by Warner Music Group, but they're owned by Kate Bush. Kate Bush. Can I tell you? Music, musicians, pay attention. She's a genius. Smart girl. Listen. She might have put some weird music out there, some very flamboyant, eccentric music. Yes, but that was her that was her signature. That's her calling card. But I will tell you one thing, that woman was smart. That one was successful. She got it. And she always had charted music for a well over a decade in the UK. Just to give you that too. They're not even credited as being licensed to anyone. So Kate Bush is going to be making the majority, possibly even as much as 80% plus if she's on a basic distribution deal of the recorded music royalties generated by her masters right now. Now, last week, Running Up the Hill did 57 million chart-eligible global streams on Spotify alone, just on Spotify. Rough industry estimates means she probably would have made over $200,000 of recorded music royalties from one platform on one format streaming in one week. She's making millions of dollars again for a song that's 37 years old. Because she owns the music. There's not even license. It's just distributed by a record label. That's it. She owns the songwriting. She owns the production, the masters, everything. Wow. That's what the artists of today want. She's a role model. She's a trendsetter. I'm sure there's others, but we're just talking about this example for here. And in the music biz catalog acquisition craze, they are asking the questions was, would Kate Bush have considered selling her recordings before Stranger Things before propelling running up that hill in number one streaming track globally? Was she in the process of having those kind of conversations before Netflix music supervisor and some must see TV threw all the numbers in such a perspective deal out the window? And how much more is Kate Bush's recorded catalog worth now temporarily bigger than Bad Bunny? Who well, that guy is making buku off of streaming. And so they compare it to some other artists and what they have. The master recording ownership rights to David Geddes catalog reverted to the artist in the past decade. And Geddes sold his masters back to Warner Music Group for over $100 million last year. For David Bowie's catalog, it's been long been owned by the artist and his estate. 
exemplifying the fact that Bowie State last year announced a career-spanning distribution deal with Warner Music Group for his masters, and WMG also acquired Bowie's song rights. Pink Floyd's underlying recorded music rights are under speculation, but what they're reporting at MBW is Floyd's career-spanning recorded music rights, bundled with neighboring rights plus name and likeness rights, are being chased for acquisition by three major music companies. And that Floyd will now look to drop one of the four that are looking to be in this mix in a competitive bidding process. And that they're looking to command $600 million for their masters, for their rights. Wow. Kate Bush, the company Noble and Bright Limited, which is the record company, she owns 100%. And according to UK Company's house, had... 2.37 2.37 million pounds in cash on its balance sheet at the end of 2021. And that's going to grow following the chart topping success this summer. That is wild. Then you have Queen. Their recordings catalog worldwide outside of North America, owned by Queen Productions Limited. And they license the recordings to the Universal Music Group for most of the world. But Freddie Mercury's estate and the band own the underlying copyrights. Drake, who just put out a new album, he inked a deal with Universal Music Group that reportedly was in the region of $400 million, famously signed for many years to a complicated combination of Young Money, Cash Money, and UMG Republic Records. But his more recent material, including Certified Lover Boy from last year, carries the credit on streaming services OVO under exclusive license to Republic Records. And OVO is Drake's own record company. How about that? And that's the kind of thing that all these major artists know. Hey, they are controlling their masters, they're controlling their content, and they're pushing it out, and they let the record labels distribute for a cut, but they're not letting the record labels control anymore. The record labels are losing control. Because what leverage does music or does record these record labels have? Except to distribute. So they're distributor distributors, that's it. But they're not promoters. Hell, they took all the promotion out of radio. Because radio doesn't matter anymore. And it used to. The record labels and the radio companies need to go ahead and start working together again. They really should. Because at least the artists will say, you know what? Radio is still important. There's still a lot of people that need radio to promote themselves. It's another outlet. It doesn't have to be the outlet, but streaming and radio should complement each other. And maybe I don't expect radio to go ahead and follow streaming re- immediately because obviously in the music discovery, some program directors, some music directors, they're not going to go ahead and put something on right away. I get that. But they should. Now, this story, by the way, there's a whole lot more to it. They talk about other artists here when it comes to Taylor Swift or Bruce Springsteen or Bob Dylan or Aerosmith. You can go and look for that. The link is on broadcasterspodcast.com. As long as all the other stories I talk about here on the show, look for it all in the show description broadcasterspodcast.com it's all right there for you now that ringer story that fred jacobs brought up i didn't get a chance to read bring that up yet but i'll bring that up right now about how it's the end of the music charts as we knew them nate rogers was the guy that wrote that story in uh the ringer and so in this story i just want to go and take a couple of things she's been a star since she was 19 and her 1978 debut single, Wuthering Heights, hit number one in the UK. And she pushed back against traditions as much as any pop star with every new album or departure, every new sound, a twist. For instance, in the 1982 LP of The Dreaming, there's one point in the album where she features an impression of her as a donkey. So the song, when it debuted on the charts a couple weeks ago after Stranger Things, it reached number eight on the UK singles chart and then eventually hit into the top 10 of the Billboard Hot 100, which is incredible. Incredible. The song is, by some metrics, doing better than the likes of new songs from Harry Styles, Lizzo, and Bad Bunny. The biggest song on the country right now. And of course, we know this has happened before. 
We can always go back to Wayne's World and how that got Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody the chart higher than it did in 1976. In 76, they got the number nine. 1982 got the number two. Then you had also Freddie Mercury's death that also contributed to that as well. Seal's Kiss from a Rose from the Batman. Uh, was it Batman Forever? Or I forget which Batman movie it was. But it didn't even make the Hot 100 when it was released in 1984. Oh, Batman Forever. There we go. And then it shot the number one in 1995 thanks to the movie Batman Forever. When considering the way charts are changing to include more older music, though the Kate Bush resurgence is still an aberration, they make mention of how the songs that kind of bubble up and then bubble back down. And then you have other instances where it's a monumental leap on the charts. But a renaissance doesn't exist in a vacuum, and the Kate Bush renaissance is no exception. Pop stars tend to hang around until they overstay their welcome which is what makes Bush's notorious reclusivity particularly alluring. She's largely avoided live shows her entire career and rarely grants interviews. And the fact she posted a brief statement about the Stranger Things flurry was notable industry news. For decades, discovering her discography has felt like discovering a secret stash that was hiding in plain sight. She's a musician's musician, one that artists name check and cover, and running up that hill always seems to be the song that comes up. And it's been referenced several times. In the, sh the show, the OC uses placebo's Posido cover to set the mood as Ryan runs away from his troubles again. Or you could have heard the recent covers from the car seat headrest or Meg Myers or Fiona Apple's reference in the song Fetch the Bolt Cutters. Or the re-recorded version she did for the London Summer, Sum London Summer Olympics, uh, Summer Olympics, excuse me. Oh, I'm fumbling over in 2012. Big Boy from Outcast is actually one of the biggest Kate Bush fans on the planet. And a few years ago, he tried to get to the bottom of what makes that song such a perfect song. He said the pitch for, quote, one, it was good to pedal your bike to. It made you go fast. But more than that, he added, it encapsulates the mysterious cinematic experience that is being a fan of her work. You didn't know what was coming around the corner. And when that song ended, you didn't know if it was going into another song or if it was like a B or C section. So there's a lot more the story talks about, but I'm going to just leave it right there. I think I got the point across. There's more in the Ringer article that they talk about, but it's a matter of the message that comes in the song from Kate Bush that really makes a big difference and really resonates for people because you're looking at somebody else's shoes. It's looking at a situation and looking at the other person's perspective, which is a great message. And that resonates for more. So maybe that song makes some bigger imprint than maybe a talking head psycho killer song from 1977 that was really great that also got included in, in stranger things or the song that came from musical youth and past the duchy but that soundtrack for stranger things they keep picking great songs that just resonate and they just pick the right songs and sometimes it just works like our tv shows across the board that happens all the time and i can appreciate that they're doing a good thing by doing that but New music more than ever, I've started to appreciate and really think about what radio stations used to play and what songs, why those songs were cool and hip at the time. When I think of, like, say, WNEW, or you think about K Rock in Los Angeles, or, you know, like down here in Miami, we had W. S-H-E, things like that. We would just have this different resonating of rock songs. And what were the artists that were playing? The, what were the the honor personalities that were playing those songs and putting them out there? Like, it's all that. That's just fascinating. But radio, back to them. Kate Bush is teaching you a lesson. Kate Bush is owning you. She's owning the music industry because nobody in the music industry is making money off that record except her. In the music and radio industry... She's the only one making the money because she's smart. And you could have drawn some interest for people to go in and listen to your radio stations or for the music music to be put out there so that you can get more traction off of it. But no, no, because the audience doesn't need you anymore. You're becoming irrelevant every day. And if you both want to get more money coming in and it's not, listen, the older music's going to run out. All right. Those publishing deals. 
you're going to keep begging artists to interpolate over and over to make more money off of it because then the older music is only going to be the thing that's less valuable it's a commodity but you're not making new commodities you're not generating new content that's also worth it they just become disposable singles there are no albums where's the value behind it you're forgetting that part that's what everybody's got to learn they got to understand what's happening here that's the show for this week thank you for listening to the broadcasters podcast and checking the show out make sure to d- d- listen and rate and review the show on apple podcasts and on spotify please i would really appreciate that it will be very important and, and it would mean a whole lot to me if you did so i hope you'll consider doing that it would be mean so much so i hope you'll consider that for this next episode and keep subscribing spotify Amazon, wherever you find your podcast. I hope you'll do that. And until next week, remember that content is king and the control of your content is in your hands. Thank you for listening to the Broadcasters Podcast. Find all the links to subscribe to the show by going to broadcasterspodcast.com. And don't forget to check out the King of Podcasts wrestling program, the Wrestling Is Real Podcast, exclusively at wrestlingisreal.com.